What is up, YouTube? I'm the original Renaissance man, Devon Da Vinci, and you're watching Da Vinci Reacts. Now, I'm gonna be getting into a video uh, from a uploader that I've just recently been, I can't say introduced to, but I've just so happened to come across. Um, I will be subscribing to them, so by the time you look at this video, I'll already have them listed in my subscriptions. And this is Counter Arguments, and he has a video on religious liberty. I have seen this video, but I would like to uh, react to it, or at least analyze it for this channel. And, you know, pause it every once in a while to go ahead and talk about some things that I find interesting. Like I said, I don't necessarily like picking on religious people or arguments or anything well religious people i more so have an issue with the arguments themselves now if you have something that can counter or go against that argument then you know feel free to go ahead and um let me know what you think and everything else and you know if it's something that makes sense i'll go ahead and give you credit for it but um let's go ahead and check this out and see what he has to offer On June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that it's unconstitutional to deny marriage to homosexuals, and suffice to say, not everyone took it well. In Rowan County, Kentucky, a county clerk by the name of Kim Davis refused to issue marriage licenses to gay couples because of her religious belief that marriage is only between one man and one woman. The Supreme today, Court denied your stay. We are not issuing marriage licenses today. So Based would, on what? I would ask you all Why to are you not issuing marriage licenses today? Because... You see, as a county clerk, Kim Davis's name would have been on the license issued to gay couples. And because of her religious beliefs, she couldn't stand for that. We're not leaving until we have a license. We're not leaving until we have a license. Do your job. Well, yeah. So she went with her conscience and effectively stopped issuing marriage licenses to everybody, which resulted in a lawsuit and eventually five days in jail. Little did she know, a governor by the name of Mike Huckabee, who was running for president, didn't think that Kim Davis had done anything wrong. So on the day that she was released from jail, this happened. Pause. Okay, first of all, quick lesson for anybody that might be new to politics or don't really pay attention to politics. Um, Usually when a politician is doing something, there's always an ulterior motive to it. Um, chances are he doesn't give a damn about this woman's specific argument, but he knows that by presenting this argument to his voter base, it'll get uh, him more support from his evangelical Christian, uh, I was about to say followers, but well, I guess technically followers. Um, yeah, so pretty much that's all it is. Like anytime you see a politician trying to uh, present some type of social issue or anything like that, for the most part, there are some of them that legitimately support what they're, you know, um, fighting for. But usually they tend to do it just to try to gain favor for that specific uh, demographic. Look, like I have hair in my eye or something. Don't you hate when that happens? I just want to give God the glory. He is, his people have rallied, and you are a strong people. It is far more than one clerk saying she will not issue marriage licenses. It's that every one of us will have to decide whether or not we want to keep this great republic or whether we are willing to sacrifice it and surrender it to tyranny. And I think we gather here today to say we will not. He almost said gay, you hear that? Surrender to the tyranny of one branch of government. All right. Another quick comment. Um, it's funny how he sits there and talk about we're not going to surrender to tyranny. And the only issue is she was a county clerk. You're a. a well, I, guess elected official kind of isn't an elected official either way you work for the government now working for the government you're that you're you have to check your religion at the door there are certain things that the constitution says you can and can't do and one of them definitely is you cannot discriminate on someone based on you know race gender sexual or is sexual orientation already in it if it isn't then it should be um you know different things like that and the fact that you're like oh well I, you're discriminating against me because you're not allowing me to discriminate against other people like you don't see the irony in that argument or that joke or well it's a joke yeah it's 
to me is a joke. I am willing to spend the next eight years in the White House leading this country, but I want you to know I'm willing to spend the next eight years in jail, but I'm not willing to spend one day under the tyranny of people who believe they can take our freedom and conscience away. Yeah, that should be our jobs. <laughs> Anybody going to take your freedom and liberty away, it's going to be me. How did we go from a lone county clerk willing to disobey the law because of a personal objection to sacrificing an entire country to tyranny? Well, one of the things that Mike Huckabee mentioned was the tyranny of one branch of government. If we're going to get to the bottom of this, let's start here. In the United States of America, there are three branches of government. The executive branch, which is the president living in the White House. The legislative branch, which is Congress working in the Capitol building. And finally, there is the judicial branch, the head of which is the Supreme Court. And this is the branch that Mike Huckabee claims is tyrannical. So what exactly do these three branches have the power to do when it comes to laws? The legislative branch makes laws, the executive branch carries out laws, and the judicial branch evaluates laws. The power is effectively divided, but these are the powers that each branch has. Now the question is, did the Supreme Court go rogue and overstep their legal authority when they ruled that gay marriage is a constitutional right? Not what did the, the Supreme least. Court do in Obergefell versus Hodges? Well, sorry to be anticlimactic, they did exactly what the Supreme Court is supposed to do. They evaluated the law which said homosexuals could not get married, they determined that such a law is unconstitutional, and they cited the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to back up that decision. Whether or not you agree with their decision is another matter. As far as power goes, this is what the Supreme Court has the power to do. Think of them as the referees in a football game. Congress, the president, state governments, the police can all play this game of passing and enforcing laws just as long as they're playing within the boundaries of the Constitution. The courts are there to blow the whistle when somebody steps out of bounds. And in case you think this is too much power, understand that a Supreme Court made up of different justices in the future can overturn rulings that have been made in the past. With all of this being said, why is Mike Huckabee throwing around the word tyranny? The Supreme Court cannot make a law. They cannot make it. If we allow the judicial branch just to make up law without the people's elected representatives, you turn the Constitution into a thing of wax. But did they, they really make up, up the law? law. Apparently, he thinks the Supreme Court did what Congress is supposed to do. Yes, of course the Supreme Court can't make a law, and that's not what they did. They ruled that any law which bans this is unconstitutional. That's not making up a law, that's interpreting the Supreme Law. Again, this is what the Supreme Court has the authority to do. But just for the sake of argument, let's pretend the Supreme Court snuck into the Capitol one night and made up a law. And let's even give Mike Huckabee a magic wand so he can throw out that law that we are also pretending exists. What is Governor Huckabee's argument now? Well, he would point to Congress, of course. If we're going to legalize gay marriage, we ought to do so through the legislative branch. This was not done through the legislative process. The legislature has to make it. The executive branch has to sign it. How do I exercise the power no, of the sword, really which is the executive branch, without the power of the legislature? I would say when, when the Congress provides enabling legislation, and the people's representatives vote and it gets to my desk and we'll consider it. Okay, let's suppose that happened. Congress passes a law that legalizes gay marriage at a federal level. Would Governor Huckabee be satisfied? Actually, no, he probably wouldn't be satisfied. At that point, he would probably wave his magic wand to throw out that law and then argue for states' rights, that the individual states should be deciding on gay marriage. The only law she's following is the Kentucky law, which by constitutional amendment defines marriage as a man and a woman. The state specifically requires her to fill it out with male and female, and until they change that, I don't see how you can ask her to violate what is on that form Pardon. and the Kentucky Constitution, which is explicitly clear. So now let's suppose that that happened. All 50 states legalized gay marriage on their own. Let's say the Kentucky legislature passed a law that allowed homosexuals to get married. Is Mike Huckabee finally satisfied? Is this the point where he turns to Kim Davis and says you're on your own as he plays the Star Spangled Banner on the base? Or is he going to wave that magic wand one more time? What about county clerks? They Should they issue same-sex marriage licenses? If they have a, a conscientious objection, I think they should be excused. What about county clerks? If they should they issue same-sex marriage licenses? If they have a, a conscientious objection, I think they should be excused. Pause. Okay, that is just flat out bad. Like, 
I can't express how bad that is. <laughs> oh, I, I, I just have a conscientious objection, so I'm not going to... That's like having a... Like imagine if you were in the military and you have been training with this person for months and months and maybe even a couple years and then you get thrown over to uh, another country in a, to fight in a war and you're on the front lines and you're like, hey, I need you... To, to lay down some cover fire so I can go over there and we can try to flank them and, you know, get them up from behind. Okay, stop, pause. But <laughs> so we can try to <laughs> catch them off guard <laughs> and kill them. What if the person that was with you was like, oh, well, yeah, well, actually, I'm against killing. Then you're kind of in the wrong fucking situation. You're, this isn't cut out for you. You shouldn't have applied for it. So if you, well... I, I can't really even explain it because, like, if you find it, if you had an issue with it, you shouldn't have applied for it. But then at the same time, that means that it's that you're kind of giving it a constitutional pass because, like, then you're saying it's okay to discriminate as long as if you have a conscientious difference. Fact of the matter is, you're putting your own personal beliefs into the Constitution. If you go into a damn government job, you should be there to fulfill the laws of the country, not of your own personal beliefs or of a specific state. Or if you are doing it from a specific state and there's an issue, then it should be settled with the federal law, in my opinion. If they have a conscientious objection, At least in social I think issues. they should be excused. I think they should be excused. Let's get this straight. If the Supreme Court rules that gay marriage is constitutional, the argument is that it should be left up to Congress. If Congress passes a law legalizing gay marriage, the argument is that it should be left up to the states. And if the states legalize gay marriage, now the argument is that people who don't like that law should be excused from obeying the law from okay here's a rhetorical question why are we wasting our time arguing with mike huckabee if the man is willing to change his argument every time he gets what he wants he's quite an unlikely person to care so much it's about where our goal laws post. To come from if he doesn't think the law needs to be followed so long as you're religious but as it happens huckabee is not alone here this is the same argument that kim davis's lawyer made and yes that is his name that davis was being forced to choose between her religious it's christ belief man and a Christ, man, crossing out gay marriage like a Matt Dyke, man. You thought you were going to get married to another gay person, psych, man. Abandoning that belief to keep her freedom. So it seems like regardless of where our laws come from, whether they're deemed constitutional, passed by representatives, or left up to the states, if Christian conservatives don't like the law, we're going to get this speech one way or the other. I'm not willing to spend one day under the tyranny of people who believe they can take our freedom and conscience away. Well, it looks like we finally found the source of this headache. This isn't about what laws mean or where they ought to come from. This is about whether or not religious people have to obey the law at all. In this particular tug of war, either homosexuals have the freedom to get married, or Christian conservatives have the freedom to take that freedom away. Either one group loses freedom or the other group loses freedom, apparently. Well, the only way we're going to settle this is if we figure out what religious liberty is. So what is it? Well, some people would argue that religious liberty is a matter of being allowed to practice whatever religion you please, to believe in whatever you want, to worship whoever you want, and to publicly identify as a member of X without fear of being discriminated against, jailed, or even executed for what you believe. Now let's compare this to Kim Davis. Was she sent to jail for who she is or for what she did? Was she locked up for her beliefs or for her actions? Well, if she was jailed simply for what she believed, there are tens of millions of Christians in the United States who would have been sent to prison by now. No, Davis was not jailed because of her religion. She was jailed for her actions. She disobeyed the law. Now, mm -hmm. of course, her religion was the motive for her actions, and that's worth taking into consideration, but having the right motive doesn't render your actions irrelevant. If a guy ran a red light because he was late for work, or, well, well, here's one better, because his wife was in labor, well, that motive might have an effect on how severely he gets punished. It's at least a better motive than, who cares, YOLO. See the red light back there? But if he thinks he's getting off scot-free just as soon as he tells the judge he had a conscientious objection to stopping on red, he's got another thing coming. And for good reason. He could have caused a collision with another car. Ooh. What the f is wrong with you? 
wrong with you? However, driving is not in the Constitution, and the argument that a lot of Christian conservatives are making is that it's the First Amendment of the Constitution that grants religious people the freedom to, uh, well, just freedom, really. Uh, you know what, let's leave Kentucky for a little while and travel to California, which, at the time this video was uploaded to the internet, is experiencing a terrible drought. Let's suppose there was a cult living in California that figured out a way to end this drought. Fairly simple practice, all they would need to do is sacrifice a virgin, and that's it. That's it, just, just kidnap a virgin, cut their chest open, pull out their heart, mm. and then the rain will come. Are they allowed to do this? Well, there is a law against kidnapping, and there's another law against murder. Not to mention, surgical malpractice tends to bring about legal repercussions. <laughs> but remember, what we're talking about here is religious liberty. At least we're taking this theory for a spin that religious liberty entails being allowed to break certain laws if you have a conscientious objection. So if that is the case, if religious liberty really means that a person can break a law any time their religion leads them to believe that they're doing the right thing in spite of that law? Well, great. Now we've got a religious cult running around California killing teenagers, and apparently the Constitution protects them. No, no, this doesn't work. Maybe we're missing something. Let's get back to the Constitution and find out what the First Amendment really gives American citizens the right to do. Uh, free press, religion, uh, speech, assembly, and protest. I think those are the five things that you get from that. Okay. It gives American citizens the right to peacefully protest. It allows them to express any idea or opinion they might have. It protects the press, and it makes sure that the government remains secular. And naturally, this means that American citizens can practice any religion they want. But it doesn't say anything here about religious people being allowed to abstain from secular laws. So which one of these outranks the other when they're not seeing eye to eye? If the answer is religion, if the laws of a country play second fiddle to the laws of a religion, why bother having laws in the first place? What good are these three branches of the federal government? What good are state governments? What good is the Bill of Rights? Or the Constitution for that matter? Why bother electing judges, or governors, or representatives, or senators, or presidents? Hell, what good is the vote? The only way that these things hold any value is if the law of the land applies to every single citizen. If it doesn't, none of this has any effect. Furthermore, don't you think the Founding Fathers would have noticed the irony of the supreme law allowing citizens to ignore the law? Don't you think that's just a little counterproductive? The entire point of having laws is to maintain a civilized society. If religious people can blow off whatever laws they please insofar as they can point to a passage in their holy book, society is not going to remain civil for very long. So unfortunately for Christian conservatives, religion is not some kind of hall pass. You still have to follow the law just like everyone else. Oh sure, you can still break the law if you really don't believe in it, but don't play the victim when you get arrested. Yeah. Everyone who breaks the law gets in trouble. There's nothing special about Christians in this regard. But the good news is, civil disobedience is far from the only option on the table. If you live in a democratic republic, you can petition, protest, state your opinion or your arguments publicly, you can advocate for any law you want to replace it, vote for whoever you want, you can even run for office yourself. But as long as a law has been passed, enforced, and deemed constitutional, there needs to be consequences when that law is broken. And that's not tyranny, that's how we maintain a civilized society. Life is a breeze when you're at ease. Life is what you make. Well, um, yep. So he makes a lot of sense in this video. Um, if you guys agree with it, be sure to check out his channel. He has a bunch of other videos with all kinds of arguments. I'm sure you guys definitely would enjoy listening to him. Um, he's very by the book, so a lot of times he won't necessarily look into like context or anything like that. So if you're looking at something and you're like, well, that technically doesn't make sense because these things aren't necessarily equal. Just remember, he's not looking that deep into it. He's just looking at the very bare surface. Like, he doesn't go into context or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's funny how um, people just assume, like, freedom of speech and everything else just means that they have the right to say whatever the hell they want. And that's that, that, there's nothing that comes out of that. Now, I'm going to try to connect this with something else. I'm going somewhere with it, so just bear with me for a second. Um, 
Like there, I I I'd got a lot of comments with um my video on Louis C.K. and the N word, and there was a lot of people in the comment section that said, well, not a lot, but there was a few people in the comment section that mentioned that um that like you should just be able to say whatever you want, and if people get offended, that's their problem. To that, I say bullshit. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Someone getting offended by something, depending on the context, that could be an issue with them. So if you hear someone use the N-word, but they're using it in like a historical context, like they're just saying something generic, like, oh, well, one of the slurs that they used for black people back in the day was the N-word. And then that person gets mad. What did you just say to me? Yeah, that, that they have a problem. <laughs> That's someone you don't really want to have an argument or a discussion with. But... If you feel like you can just say whatever you want and just walk up to somebody and just say the N-word and think that they don't have a right to get offended, then that's really your problem. I've had people that have asked me, like, um, well, what exactly should we do? Well, like I said like I said before, all you got to do is just ask somebody. Like, if it's something that they're comfortable with. If it's not, then just don't worry about it. Like, why is it that you feel like you have to, like, you can't make an argument without including something that offends them? Now, like I've told you guys, I don't really, um, I don't get offended by the N word in the in when it comes to historical context or anything like that. But no matter what you say, if you say it in a certain way, I'm going to get offended by it. You call me an asshole if it's just a friend of mine. Hey, this asshole is crazy. I'm gonna look at him like that's funny. Like, okay, I get what you're. We we already established that you don't really see me as an asshole, so I can take that as kind of like a joke. But if it's if it's my very first time seeing you and you're like, hey, what's up, asshole? I'm gonna be like. Who the f are you? <laughs> like, like, don't sit here and talk to me. Like, I don't know who the hell you are. And then don't get mad if I get offended by it. Like, you have to, there has to be an understanding. And you can't just change the definition of something. Like I said, I know I'm off topic right now, but whatever. Um, you can't just change the definition of something and then get mad when people get offended by it. Like, there was another video I did with the, the word, with the F word, or the full version of it, or whatever. And they said, like, oh, well, in my country, this means this, or the way me and my friends say it, it means this, so people shouldn't get offended. No, that's you and your friends. Y'all have sat down and discussed that. Now, if you're in a country where that word has a completely different meaning, like I know in, uh, I don't know if it's fully Great Britain or if it's just England or something, or if it's just England, but I know that the word fag means cigarette. So if you say the word fag over there, chances are they're gonna look think of that. But over in America, there's a specific definition for that word and it's usually seen as something that's derogatory so if you say it chances are people are going to automatically jump to the offensive one so the first thing you need to do if you've come up with a new word and you know that the people around you aren't necessarily going to be in agreement with that word or initially they don't understand what you really mean by it make sure you give your definitions of those words ahead of time like establish what you mean when you say this <laughs> otherwise they're going to take it offensively it's like it's like if somebody was walking around with a, a swastika like tattooed on them and i mean initially you're going to think of like the nazis and stuff you're going to take it as offensive but if they establish a well at this point it's even hard to like make an establishment but um I know that the, sim the the moral of the story was supposed to be that I understand the symbol meant something else before the Nazis started using it. And, I mean, that argument has kind of been killed at this point. But um, <laughs> if it wasn't as bad, it would be a good argument. <laughs> like, the, the symbol had meant something else, so you try to let people know, okay, no, this is the definition I'm going, what I meant by. But, I mean, I guess... Nazi paraphernalia is just way too it's, it's already been established <laughs> anyway that's been this video I hope you guys enjoyed it um, if you did make sure you hit that like button subscribe and share um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to something else uh, I'm the original Renaissance man Devon Da Vinci I hope to see you in those next videos deuces